Hey, what's up, tribe? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the TFC Audio Project Down Under. This week's episode is all about balance. We talk through what the balance system actually is and how it works, why it can be so beneficial and so fun to train, and some helpful strategies that you can explore to start improving your balance in your daily life. It's only fitting this week's episode is brought to you by TFC Balance Beams. They're our favorite simple tool for training balance in a fun and playful way, and each beam comes with our online beam training system to help you get started. We also wanted to say a huge thanks to everyone who's bought one so far. For every Tassie Oak beam we sell, we donate 10 bucks to Reforest Now to plant trees, and we're proud to say that your support has now helped plant more than 250 of them. Right now, due to demand, our beams are currently on pre-order only, so if you're keen to grab one, head to our site, tfc-shopoz.com, and it'll be on its way to you by the end of the month. All right, you're back with James and Mac, and this episode is going to be all about balance. Now, we did mention on the last podca- podcast that this week was going to be all about breathing, uh, but we've had to do a little bit of rearranging with our weekly themes, so breathing will now be next week, and yeah, we're really excited to dig into balance, um, because balance is obviously such a, a very central it's component. We do. <laughs> it's it's of, yeah, the main ph- philosophy, really. It's our thing. <laughs> yeah, it's um, a very central component of the TFC philosophy and that's because it's such an insanely important system Uh, the balance system and and capacity of movement is maintaining balance and you can even think of movement as just dynamically (laughs) maintaining your balance (laughs) in in lots of different positions Um, and yet it's very undertrained in today's society yeah, so, almost neglected or yeah, quite underappreciated. Ne- yeah, and there's you know pockets of people that really appreciate it, but as a whole, um, definitely undertrained and and could be a lot more. So that's why we're you know very keen to spread the word on balance training. Um, and also, it's just such a fun and enjoyable and sort of flow inducing activity to do. And that's a, a whole nother reason to do it besides all the sort of benefits. So mm. pretty much today we wanted to talk through what the balance system is, uh, what actually creates our sense and ability to balance, uh, how, how obviously how it works, therefore, why it's so beneficial to train, and of course, just some strategies that you can all start working on or implementing at home to start improving your balance, whatever level you're at. Yeah, cool. So, it's a good idea to delve into what, yeah, what really makes up the balance system and how it all works because it's not as simple as as it might seem on the surface i suppose mm. and basically it, it it also i like delving into a little bit of depth in terms of uh, anatomy and physiology and um, physiological processes because it helps to give a, uh, a greater appreciation for the body I, th- I feel like the the deeper you understand the body not not you know not extreme depth is necessary. You don't need to know what every bone and muscle does, but... But at least if you know some depth, you go, oh, that's really fascinating and it gives you that appreciation for... Yeah, like, and you found respect for the body and for yeah. what it's doing yeah. when it's doing its thing. Especially because all these processes just happen behind the scenes without us having to think about it. So it's Thank very, God they do. <laughs> yes, yes. Otherwise, we'd be all on the ground. Um, so, yeah, it's really good to build that appreciation and gratitude for the body, especially, um, you know, most people do have some sense of balance. Obviously, it's poor in society in general, Um, but most people can stand on their two feet and generally would take that for granted. But there's a lot of systems at play to actually even allow you to stand on two feet. Mm. So those systems, it's a very beautifully complex system, but it's basically the balance system is uh, comprised of a three primary systems and that is the vestibular system the visual system and the somatosensory system so we'll just delve into each of those please do before you lose me yes (laughs) shall do um so the vestibular system this is really fascinating actually so it's um basically we've got ears for hearing and we've also got the inner ear which is forms our vestibular system so it's basically uh, these what's known as semicircular canals, and there's three of them in each 
in the ear on both sides. Mm. And they, those canals have a fluid in them and it's called endolymph. And that fluid basically moves around, <laughs> obviously, as your head moves around. And so within the inner ear, in these canals, there's also um, these sort of hair-like cells and basically crystals of calcium carbonate. So it's getting, again, a little technical, but... I'm still with you. <laughs> still with me. So what happens is as the head moves in different planes of movement and yeah. there's sort of nodding type movement or side to side, the liquid like shaking moves. your head or yeah, like that, the liquid moves. And then that stimulates movement, obviously, of the crystals and the hair-like cells, which then gives feedback to the brain about what position your head is in and what direction it's moving. Right. Um, and it's usually it's some... Uh, combination of nod, shake, or tilt, basically. Gotcha. Um, so, interesting little fun fact as well is those crystals. This is how a lot of, uh, or a certain percentage of vertigo happens, is because those crystals can break free um, from their sort of location in those little inner ears. And this is all very small, obviously, <laughs> very tiny little crystals and, and hairs, but. The crystals can break free and then the, when the head stops moving, usually everything stops moving. Mm. But because the crystals are free, your head moves and then for a few seconds after, the crystals are moving ah, and right. still stimulating those signals. And then the, so the brain or the head still thinks it's moving when yeah, it's still. when it's still, except your eyes are telling your brain that it's still. And so it's this, this battle inside of, of what's signals. What's real and what's not yeah. really far out. So, so yeah, usually the vestibular system is working with your visual system, which we're about to talk about. Um, but usually those are two are working together to make sure that your eyes are in the right position to keep a steady gaze while your head moves around it. Mm. Um, so, yeah, very interesting stuff. So, that yeah, that leads us to the visual system. Obviously, you're getting... I'm going to guess this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're getting input from the eyes and that's sending information to the brain about, obviously, the position of the head and the body um, different limbs if they're in sight and just obviously the orientation of your head mm. um, and also other objects in the environment and so that relates to things like depth and um, motion like what direction things are moving or what velocity how fast they're moving and so obviously the eyes are a very very important <laughs> yes structure um, for that and like we said that that information combines with the information from the vestibular system to then give a, a very clear picture of what position the head is in, assuming they're all working correctly. So, for someone who's blind, who doesn't have the use of their eyes, mm -hmm. is it the vestibular system then that, that I guess helps them move around their environments a little easier, obviously through touch and... Um, yeah, when it, it, well, does that, I guess, hone in, you know, or, or is it enough to... Oh, yeah, it, it does hone in. Yeah. yeah, so the vestibular system is probably the main system when it comes to balance because that can tell you a lot about mm. your position. Um, the eyes, the visual system obviously helps feed into helps that ahead, and, yeah. you know, navigate environments because the vestibular system is not going to tell you exactly what's in front of you. It just tells you I'm upright or I'm tilting somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what they've found is with when certain areas of the brain aren't being used so um for people with blindness or deafness or you know they've lost some kind of sense then there is uh you know a, i guess there's what i'm trying to think of the word just a, a reduction reduction of that area of the brain and yep. an increase in other areas of the brain especially in terms of density and and connections and what's known as synaptic connections in those areas of the brain that are being used more so probably the vestibular system would increase its ability mm. and also it is enough to generally it is enough like uh, when a good test actually at home is just to stand on I two was feet say, yeah close your eyes and see how different it is how how well you can balance with your eyes closed versus eyes open and then do the same thing on one foot and then if you're if you want then you can do the same thing on one foot on something like a beam or something more narrow than just stable flat ground and it's pretty incredible how quickly you notice yeah it makes difference. a big difference. But I guess the more you practice, and I've noticed this, I've been doing more eyes closed stuff on the beam lately. And 
at first it's like, wow, this is impossible. Like, yeah, I've been I playing around with it too. But yeah, oh, you can't it's incredible. be on it for like a second or two at first. And then over time, the, obviously, the more time you spend, then you get used to less visual It's just input. training that vestibular system yeah. to realize where that equilibrium is and, and yeah. to find that balance. And not to rely on the visual system as much because yeah. I, I think a lot of people do rely on the visual system a lot mm. and um, that can lead into problems. So what's number three? So that brings us into number three because obviously you might not have vision, um, but you could also have the somatosensory system that lines up with the vestibular system as well. So all of these systems obviously work together, um, but each of them are very important in their own right. So uh, components of the somatosensory system, we've got interoception and exteroception. So that just basically means... So interoception is internal sensations so things like breathing heartbeat hunger and thirst um, and obviously the vestibular system is part of that so all these sensations that are within the body and another probably the most relevant to um, balance is proprioception which is basically all these senses within your muscles and joints and skin that give you feedback about your joint position in space. So if I raise my arm in front of me, I can see that my arm is being raised with my visual system. But if I close my eyes, I can also feel that my arm is moving up in that direction um, through, okay, you know, you feel the joint itself, the joint angle changes, you feel changes in the skin stretch, you know, you feel changes in muscle tension. So there's all these proprioceptors um, that basically give you all give your brain all of that feedback about body position uh wh- how your body is positioned in space hmm. very very cool yeah, um cool. and then there's exteroception and so that that's basically all external sensations so taste smell sight hearing and touch are obviously all part of those external sensations which i guess is what most people think of as the five senses um whereas there's a lot more than five senses. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But those are the five main ones. And we already obviously discussed vision and how that relates to balance. So the the next most important thing is really the tactile sensation for, um, you know, tactile and and proprioception in terms of the somatosensory system. So when we're talking about tactile, yeah, it's basically feeling something and the skin is usually the conduit to that. Whether it's breeze or water against the skin or... Yeah. yeah. And when it, when it comes to balance, uh, basically the skin is going to give you information about changes in the surface that you're on and, and the texture of the ground that you're on. So uh, that's obviously mostly mediated through the feet because that's the most common contact or weight bearing surface is the feet. But obviously if you're crawling, then you get that information through your hands as well. Um, or if you're just moving around on the ground, then you'll get that information from other areas, but primarily the feet are our conduit with the ground. And so that's why the feet are so heavily innovated. So many nerve endings are in the feet are because it's a very important, they're a very important sensor of the body. And which is why we talk about not disrupting the, that sensory function of the feet with modern shoes that, that sort of give you that big air bubble between you and the ground. Yeah, which is something that's often overlooked as well. I know we talk a lot about the shape of the shoe and, you know, wide toe box and no cushioning. But yeah, when you think about it on that sensory level, it seems like such a crime to cover up something that is doing such or playing such a big role reading all of the yeah. environment around it. Um, I mean, same with your hands. 100%. We, we use the analogy every time, but the glove and putting a glove on your hands all day and, I, I, yeah, not being able to get not actually being able to feel touch what you're something. doing. Yeah. Yeah. And a, a, probably an even better analogy at this point um, is like the difference between wearing sunglasses and a blindfold. The visual system's going to be great um, for helping you balance. <laughs> and sure, if you want to protect them or like, 
you know, shade yourself from the, the sun a little bit, then wear sunglasses, but don't wear a blindfold because that'll completely take away your visual system. Um, and obviously you can still feel a little bit through big cushioned, rigid shoes, but it's like nowhere a, near as much. It's like an airplane mask, more yeah. than a blindfold. Yeah, you can see Some sort of B-grade. Like, yeah. Really try them. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so the skin and that tactile and pressure sensation through the feet and whatever surface you're weight bearing on will give you information so you know is the ground uneven is it slippery is it um, sharp in some way and that will really really matter for how well you're able to adapt to that surface because if you didn't get that information this is why so many people roll their ankle on when they're wearing these big thick hiking boots or um, or even just you know normal running shoes so many ankle sprains and everything because they can't feel the ground as well and therefore they, their body can't respond as efficiently to a change in their body position and a change to the uneven surface. And so, and also obviously the shoe gives them a bit of a, a lever to roll over, but the sensation, better inputs equals better outputs. I think we talked about that on a previous podcast. Mm. If you get better sensory input and more sensory input, then of course you're, your brain has a better chance to have an effective response. Of course. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that's basically how it all works. It, all these systems really combine to give the brain that sort of accurate and constantly updating representation of body position. And then that then gives the brain that opportunity to have the effective movement response in uh, movement in response to changes in position. And that's all it's a lot of that is controlled and mediated through a part of the brain that's called the cerebellum and it's that's sort of at the back and sort of towards the lower half of the brain and um fun fact about the cerebellum is that it takes up about approximately 10 percent about approximately <laughs> it takes up around 10 percent of the brain's volume but it takes up 50 percent of the brain's neurons so all of the nerve cells within the brain are in the cerebellum the so happening. very very densely innervated area of the brain and that just goes it's a it's a vital part of the brain when it comes to motor control so control of movement and it, it doesn't necessarily initiate the movement commands but it go it takes all the information from the visual and uh, from the proprioceptive and the vestibular systems and then the motor commands that are happening from the top part of the brain, um, from the motor cortex, go through the cerebellum and the cerebellum then modifies those commands and makes them more adaptable um, and more accurate. Hmm. So very, very interesting and very cool system of the body. Um, th there are two main reflex circuits that help us maintain that balance and that's reflex is basically just something that happens again sub like subconsciously something that you don't have to think about um and usually is just you know very very quick very 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 quick because it's all just happens as as a In automatic instant. function yeah. of the nervous system so um the two reflexes are called the writing reflex and the tilting reflex so the writing reflex is basically maintaining stability on stable ground so easy thing is literally just standing up on two feet on what like that still may that still involves challenge to the balance system it's not a given that you should just that you can just stand up we see children enough. taking <laughs> yeah. their first steps yeah. yeah yeah you have to learn how to stand up um so stable surface and maintaining stability and this is where that quote um from jim klopman which is what we refer to as balance is actually ironically thousands of micro movements per second to give the appearance of stillness so sure once we master balance we, we can stand still but there's all these little mini movements going on to keep you sort of quote unquote still mm. um so that's pretty cool in itself and then the tilting reflex is basically more on unstable surfaces or, or narrow surfaces that don't create that basically yeah that are less stable than just say wide flat ground and 
it allows us to have more of that dynamic reaction to a change to a changing surface so it's you know a cool or an obvious example would be things like slacklining and surfing like the surfboard isn't staying the same the slackline isn't staying the same but your body is able to maintain some level of stability or stay on the board or on the line but it's constantly you can see it's constantly moving yeah, to right. do that so yeah it's uh it's really really cool stuff I obviously learned it all in uni but it's been really nice revisiting it um and you know reading up on some research and and reading that book um, balances power by jim klopman that's a really good one um and they are there, there are obviously so many things that are going into it but like we said at the beginning it's not hard to see why people take it for granted because those micro movements and it's nothing that we actually physically see every day i mean we're, we're living it when we're we're running we're walking we're standing we're jumping whatever we're doing um but we're not actually yeah i, I guess witnessing it with our own eyes the, the magic of it yeah uh, and so we don't respect it yeah or you see you see the effect of it in graceful elite movement but you don't really fully appreciate oh that's like that's you know a beautiful balance or you know mm. um or, or I think, funnily enough, we, we see that and go, wow, that's amazing balance. I could never do that. Or oh, my balance is not good. And there is this general thought process that balances some God-given inherited talent yeah. that, you know, some people have and some people don't. And that is obviously is just not true. Well, maybe not as obvious, but it's it isn't true. It's comes down to how much you use your balance system how much you challenge it because the you know the principle of adaptation applies to balance the balance system just as it applies to the muscular system and the the nervous system and everything so i guess why is it so important then we know how it works but but why (laughs) but why (laughs) tell me why So, so the yeah it's i mean kind of goes without saying but the balance system is of primary importance for every almost everything that we do i guess except for sleeping or like lying down flat on our back yeah um because anytime we raise our center of gravity above our base of support we need the balance system to be acting um in order to keep us stable otherwise we literally just fall back down Mm. um so it's extremely important for every all daily activities um even sitting a lot of people don't think about sitting as requiring balance but again if you think back t- to a, a baby they can't just sit gotta strap <laughs> them <go>, in <laughs> well you got to strap them in or they got to learn yeah. over time how to maintain balance it's not a it's not an inherited thing that you just do straight out of the womb and it does take practice and that's because they go from lying down and then into a position where yes they've got a maybe a wide base of support while they're sitting but they're not used to it their center of gravity is going every every which way um and lucky they're small because they fall a lot Mm. um so but at the other end of the scale older people who fall a lot are bigger and 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 that's that's why it's so important yes exactly so the damage that can be done at that end of the the spectrum is is yeah, 100%. And it can be deadly. Yeah. And so really, we should maintain our balance. Balance is one of the first things we learn, I suppose. Is you know, Well, it obviously applies to all developmental movements. We learn to sit, or roll, sit, crawl, squat, stand, so on. Um, but the modern environment really doesn't challenge our balance much. Or the modern environment and lifestyle. And obviously, we've talked a lot about sedentarism in the previous podcasts and how that affects our movement capacity in general. But yeah, if you think about the modern environment, it's a lot of flat level ground, you know, stairs, walls, um, chairs. Comfy chairs you're not going to fall out of. Yeah, 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 exactly. And yes, there's a lot of handrails around, which can be great balance beams, (laughs) but it's kind of culturally uh, not accepted to to do that. Um, And... That's not where they're for. They're handrails and not I mean, foot even rails. The, even the addition of a handrail <laughs> suggests that yeah, true. we can't walk up or down stairs without holding on to something, which, yeah. you know, is... Good point. And, and it's... Obviously, there's accessibility things for, you know, people course, who yeah. 
may have disabilities or um, you know can't move around the environment with with a lot of balance and that's great I think it's important obviously to have accessibility in the environment but it just goes to show I guess how much most people have lost touch with balance training and, and that type of environment does facilitate poor balance and so it's sort of up to us as the individual individual to make a, a you know a balance practice because it's not really getting done in the environment whereas of course in a natural environment there's rocks and logs and trees and um, you know things that you'd be climbing and scaling and jumping over and all of that requires a lot of balance um, which we've been doing plenty of this week plenty of yes yes out of TFC bush one um, we were just, yeah we were commenting on how it was the rock hopping really yeah, yeah. It was the rock hopping just how much balance matters for because your brain really doesn't want you to fall no. <laughs> and so if it doesn't rate your balance system highly then it doesn't let you go through the rocks quickly <laughs> it's slow going i think we talked about this on a previous podcast too. yeah yeah and i mean even watching more closely i guess with a with a more analytical eye as we were moving through that environment during the week i mean even when you were ba- balancing on a log or on a rock, you could see, if you look closely enough, you could see those micro movements, all the body really fighting to stay in that position. Yeah. You know, yeah. single legged on a, on a rock with a pretty narrow surface area. Yeah. I the mean, body's... it wasn't too hard to see the micro movements of that one. I think that's yeah. the specific one I'm thinking of, but yeah, it, there's a, there is a lot of stuff constantly going on Working. in the foot and the ankle and the knee and the hip to maintain that alignment and it feels really good to express that balance especially in a natural environment and we'll, we'll talk about that later in, in the strategies but um it's just yeah you really feel because you come up to a certain point in the rock hop and you're, you're like oh could i make that and you like your brain <laughs> touch really and go, touch and go processing it's like i really don't want to fall and hit my head because that that will really hurt or like that's not going to be good for me. Mm. And so it, it really rates balance very highly. Um, and it will protect you from certain movements and tasks that it doesn't feel you have the balance capacity for. Mm. Um, so yeah, modern environment, modern lifestyles, they, they promote poor balance. And as we can see in the population and, and the research is that poor balance increases the risk of things like falls and... Um, sports injuries, so or was, just injuries in general, but especially in sports. With your physio experience and and dealing with with older patients, uh, what was it like to 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 work with people who had falls or you know that that had been their undoing, I suppose? What did they make of the whole idea of of falling and the injury that they'd suffered from it? Yeah, yeah. So this is this does hit home pretty hard because I did work in. Um, age care or in a residential aged care facility for about six months while I was setting up the product side of TFC and obviously getting very into balance and essentially working with the worst of the worst when it comes to balance and a good majority of those patients or oh, sorry residents um, in that facility were there because of a fall and because and it happens to so many people. Most people will know, either have had a fall in their family or will know someone who has had one. My grandmother, yeah. There you go, my oh, grandmother. Probably both. both. Yeah. And my grandfather, and yeah. Now my great aunt as well. And and very common injuries when you have a fall is things like fracturing your neck of, neck of femur, so fracturing your thigh bone. And these aren't falls off ladders or... No. Off this is just falls while you're gardening. This is, I mean, obviously people do fall off ladders mm. and that is also terrible, but this is just falling just about your daily life. Yeah. And I suppose most, most of them either had no idea that their balance was so poor until they had that fall and it was a stark realization or they knew that their balance was poor, but either thought or had been told, I hope they hadn't been told, but thought for whatever reason that that was just because they were getting old mm. and there was nothing they could do about that. Um, that was what they believed. And it's like, oh, it, you know, I just got old and had a fall and that's sort of, it's so normalized, but and it's, not, it's I not don't normal. mean to sound defeatist, but I mean, once they get to that age and then they have a fall, 
it's getting close to that point where it's the point of no return in that once you once you are that age and you have that fall trying to a uh, recover and then to get your balance back and then beyond to a point where it should be it's a very 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 long road it's a long and tough road yeah and this is why so many uh, older people end up in aged care facilities after a fall is because they do have some kind of you know significant injury like a femur fracture or a concussion something that puts them out of action for a matter of weeks and months and because they're probably already operating on a low movement capacity then they have that forced essentially forced bed rest um, or very minimal movement because of the fracture or the concussion or whatever injury they had then they end up really declining their their physical capacity really declines until and, and it basically can take away their independence they no longer Which means can their get up capacity and capacity deteriorates just as, as well. fast because everything they once could do has now been taken away from them and yeah. they need someone to watch them and help them with everything they do exactly and and I'd have a lot of chats with the residents when I was there about you know you know what they I guess they they'd love it they'd love a chat <laughs> and they of would course. love a chat and they'd be talking about the garden they used to have at their home that they had to sell after they had a fall in the garden and um you know the fact that they're scared of falling now obviously because it's a scary thing falling and not knowing how to land or not knowing how to control yourself it, and if you're can, on your own I mean you hear horrible stories oh, yeah. about people who I, I remember we did a news story with a bloke who fell over um during it was during a cyclone i think um and he fell Jeez. over and couldn't get to the phone and i think the police found him three or four days later no, uh-huh. he was okay but oh. he'd been on what? you know he'd been on the ground for three days four days waiting for help yeah um so the trauma of, of even that experience I mean, oh. I guess the reason we're talking about all this is because you just don't want to fall yeah <laughs> and you, you don't want to get to the point where yeah. that's a possibility exactly and and one it's prevention for when you're older if you start balance training now and you find it fun and enjoyable and you and and it's you know part of your life then you're far far less likely to fall in the future when you're old but there's also times where i've been extremely (laughs) thankful that my balance system is good because there'd be a sketchy a sketchy rock where i've come off it and had to then jump onto another rock and stabilize very quickly and if i hadn't then um you know some some kind of i'm sure i would have been injured in some way and there's also been a lot of times where um you know i'll go uh, just to be about to roll my ankle i stepped on an unsteady surface that i wasn't ready for about to roll my ankle and then quickly like just reverted back to the a, a good alignment and saved the ankle from a from an ankle sprain and so yes in the future we want to prevent stuff but there's a lot of stuff that this also helps prevention wise in the now in the sort of current and i guess that's why we started hacking the system um it's sort of a way that well we want to help older people helping younger people learn about the importance of their balance mm mm-hmm early on and, and developing habits where, yeah, they, they have a relationship with their ba- their balance and they want to keep working on it and it's fun to keep working on it, then yeah. hopefully we can we can see results and see those sort of injuries like knee and ankle injuries prevented. Yeah, exactly, because sports injuries... So, yeah, another... So, with the older generation, most people don't think about or train their balance until they have a fall and it's like wow i really need to train it and it's it's never too late per se but by that time it's a lot much tougher road Mm. and equally in the realm of sports obviously any fall can cause an injury so wrist injuries and shoulder injuries from falling on your outstretched hand and concussions like i said broke my arm falling off a flying fox there you go broke my wrist falling i think my brother pushed me but uh, (laughs) i got pushed too yeah that's the story we'll go with yeah yeah yeah. um it was all play so play (laughs) is risky um but yeah on the sporting field there's just it's so so prevalent to have these these non-contact injuries like knee ACL tears, knee ligament injuries, ankle sprains, um, especially those two are the most common. And most people, well, all rehab programs for those injuries, once they're done, um, 
either you know post injury or post surgery will involve some kind of balance and proprioceptive training and this is because balance and proprioception matter a lot for joint stability and joint alignment which is very key to preventing injuries and but efficiency on the flip side you look at all of these sports and a lot of sports people play where is that balance and proprioceptive yeah. training they're not doing that seriously as a preparatory exercise or as like a, a quote-unquote prehab exercise. Um, and I think part of that is because the way a lot of balance training done is really boring. Um, it's sort of just, you know, stand on one leg or stand on this piece of cushioning or piece of foam and do various stuff. And obviously there's, there's great things you can do on cushioning and on, on one leg, but it has to be engaging and it has to be yeah, fun. It has to have that play-based element as well. And obviously, balance isn't the be-all, end-all of injury prevention. A lot of it comes down to strength. But you can't really express strength or power or whatever without at least some level, some level of proprioception and balance. And in general, the better your proprioception and balance, the better your reactive stability, which means, okay, I'm going out of alignment here. How quickly can I get back into that alignment? Which equals how quickly can I get back to it? expressing at optimal strength and power um and so yeah it really should be trained a lot more as a preventative um just like strength training but especially for younger kids and anyone actually i talk about this in the workshop um is that you can combine strength mobility and balance into certain exercises you get a lot of bang for your buck it's extremely challenging and and really you'll you'll know it works your muscles but it also challenges your balance and hip stability and arch control and all of these things i guess we just got to make balance as sexy as strength because Basically. when people hear you're working on your strength or you're strong <laughs> yeah then you know it's an impressive feat but i guess we just need to make balance balance the new strength <laughs> yeah i'm working on it yeah. <laughs> um and mind you um people do love watching uh, yeah, feats of, of balance which is really cool but i think it's it's about yeah sh- reminding people or showing showing people that you know you don't have to get to the elite level like you see but you can you can express an amazing amount of balance and that is the beauty of balance training or a big beauty of balance training is that it can improve amazingly quickly, especially if you're starting at a a sort of low level Mm. because it's not relying on, I guess, so much structural changes in the muscles that, you know, where you have to... It's reps really, isn't it? Well, it's it's nervous system changes really. It's, you know, efficient feedback loops between all those systems Mm. and your brain and the muscles that are doing it all but a lot of that's yeah mediated through the nervous system not so much through structural changes in your muscles and joints mm. and tendons and all of those things that slow make strength and power and all these things a bit slower to improve yeah um so yeah it's it's sort of mostly mediated by the nervous system because it like we said it's sort of mostly micro movements um and Pretty much, any, yeah. Pretty much anyone, unless there's, they've got some kind of severe uh, condition that stops them, um, or that inhibits their vestibular function, which which does happen, and that really that is really tough and it needs specific treatments. But anyone, aside from that, can improve their balance to some degree. It doesn't matter what age you are, um, and it doesn't really matter. Like, there's so many ways the body can compensate for various injuries and and pain and so on um but balance training can be a really really great way to uh, get moving Mm. um so speaking of the physical we'll just go through quickly the the physical and mental benefits of balance training um obviously major physical benefit is not falling over (laughs) tick because that can be life-threatening and it's something it's yeah it seems obvious but yeah no one thinks they're going to fall until they do fall and so yeah Prevent it if you can. The better your balance is, the less you fall. One plus one equals two. Um, <laughs> joint, joint stability and alignment. So we sort of talked about this before, but essentially there's a, an, 
a quote unquote optimal alignment for your joints or where they're, where they're centrated. And this is where the force travels through the joints in the most efficient way. And so it's going to be different person to person a little bit based on their own individual structure and, and um, you know, a lot of different factors really. But in general, um, a stable joint position will be a balanced position. And so a, a really cool thing to do is jump on a beam and the beam teaches you what a stable and aligned joint position is through the feet, ankles, knees and hips. Because if you're not stable and aligned, then you fall off the beam. And if you are, then you stay on the beam. Or if you go out of that stable and aligned position, can you quickly get back into it through, that's the reactive stability. Mm. Um, so obviously tr balance training helps with that. And it can also help with coordination and reaction speed. So again, all of these sort of nervous system capacities that really matter. And, and in terms of the sports injuries that we were talking about before, um, They've, you know, they've done studies on balance training for preventing sports injuries. And they have found a very, a very um, good effect for things like ankle sprains and things like that. But they've also found that balance training alone isn't going to be as good as balance training with strength training or balance training with plyometric training. And it's, that almost goes without saying. It's like if you do more variability, more various types of training, they're all going to work together. But yeah, it's all it's about going, okay, I'm improving my balance, but then I'm, I'm applying that improved balance and joint stability to my strength, training. strength and yeah. plyometrics and, you know, power. Yeah. Plyometrics slash power. Um, or like you did so this on. week, apply the strength to your balance, balance training. Yeah. Yeah. On the beam with, with a boulder over your head or. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, exactly. Weaving them in together. Yes. Yes. hundred percent. Um, so yeah, plenty of physical benefits. The mental benefits as well are, are very interesting. So, um, I was just listening last week, uh, to a huge, uh, podcast on Huberman lab. I might've even uh, mentioned it in the last week's podcast, but basically he's talking about neuroplasticity. The whole podcast is about neuroplasticity, which is basically the adaptability of your brain. And that relates a lot to learning. Um, and so he was talking about in this podcast how stimulation of the vestibular system, especially errors, um, making errors and having to sort of create or adapt with different movement patterns to try and fix up those errors causes... So that obviously s signals or um, stimulates the cerebellum mm. um, like we talked about before. And then the cerebellum can signal deeper brain areas to release these neurotransmitters that promote neuroplasticity and learning. So dopamine, acetylcholine and norepinephrine are the, the technical terms for them. But basically they're these neurochemicals, chemicals in the brain that promote learning and adaptability. And the cool thing is, is it promotes learning and adaptability for the motor skills. So what you're learning and obviously that's, very important for survival in a in an ancient or natural context like we've talked about before but it also promotes plasticity for every, anything else that you're learning so you could do a, a novel you know a um, a new skill learn a new skill like beam training or slacklining or surfing and then go read a book and do some study and your brain's going to pick up and memorize wow, that information go. much better than if you hadn't done that um, balance or vestibular activating activity. How cool. Yeah, it's really cool. It's a little hack, little little brain hack. Yeah. Um, but yeah, really, really cool thing to know. And there's a whole book as well called Smart Moves about um, the, yeah, the, the activation of the vestibular system and its relation to learning. And it's sort of, it's mostly targeted at kids. And it's very interesting that we put, children into this highly highly sedentary environment to do schoolwork and academic work thinking oh yeah they need to sit still and do their academic work of when course. the balance and the vestibular activation aka movement in different planes of movement is what stimulates learning and neuroplasticity and so it's this weird backwards concept that is just outdated and and 
I think is slowly changing mm. with, you know, flexible seating arrangements and stand up desks and, and people, kids being allowed to sit on the ground and things like that. But I know that there's a lot more that needs to change. When I mean, I saw it at the school <coughs> out of Ballandine, you know, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago. Mm hmm schools yeah. that are adopting you know a nature-based play approach to to learning and getting the kids outdoors as much as possible and yeah it's refreshing to see that there are and that's a state school at ballandine run by yeah which is susan, epic. susan <laughs> evans is the principal out there and she's doing yeah incredible stuff incredible stuff with those kids and it's working yeah and that is that releasing this week or next no next week uh next friday next yeah friday. next friday that one stay tuned out. for that on stories told <laughs> very, that is a very inspiring story actually and all the um places that they are rolling this out uh, i know in some northern european countries they're rolling that kind of thing out and rolling out sort of mandated movement breaks throughout each study period at school i think it's like 10 minutes per hour, per every hour um and they're doing research on it and finding that all of the academic scores are going up by doing maybe less academic work more movement but they're they're the movement makes their academic work more efficient. And that applies to kids and it'll apply to adults as well because we are moving beings or we're supposed to be moving beings and we learn through movement. And this is just the, the sort of the science as to why. <laughs> and I guess uh, I guess it all it needs a bit of a, a shift then as well. In the workplace, it's good to see that it's happening in the in the classroom, but... I know people are still allowed to take smokers breaks at work, um, mm. but good luck getting a 10 minute movement break every hour. Should be able to take a beam break. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to get into the uh, corporate offices soon, <laughs> I think. Um, but yeah, hundred percent. And so a lot of very good mental benefits and it just, it also balance training also just, can improve overall mental well-being, and we know this about exercise in general. But there is something about the satisfaction. What well, first the frustration of falling off something <laughs> repeatedly. You know, hopefully not, you know, preferably not in a dangerous way, but jumping on a beam and or standing on a beam and repeatedly falling off, or getting trying to get up on the surfboard and falling off, and it's that frustration period, and that those areas are really what stimulates that neuroplasticity that we were talking about, but then followed by the deep satisfaction of like, yes, I nailed that, like, oh, I got that skill now, oh, I can stand on one leg on the beam now, or, and the awe that the body was able to do yeah. that when only a few got, tries ago it couldn't. Yeah, exactly, and it goes, whoa, I've just figured that out, or like when you first jump on a slack line like you were experiencing the other day or an indoor board. Indo board and you're getting that stanky leg and it's going everywhere and you're like whoa <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah after half you know 20 minutes half an hour an hour or a couple of sessions of practice then it, your brain's tuned it in and it, and it's made all those little micro well it's made these big macro movements into little micro movements mm. and then you get that appearance of stability um, and it feels really good. Yeah. And so that, that's why, that's why big reason why we love it so much is just, it's just fun and you do get all those other benefits as well. Mm. Um, so I guess we'll lead into how, yeah. how to how get to started. Get some in your life. Yeah. So I think these how parts are probably going to start sounding a little repetitive, <laughs> um, because get outdoors. Yeah. A lot of it is so Stand on a beam. <laughs> Play with a hacky sack. Um, <laughs> but yeah, a lot of it is, you know, all so important and so connected as well. And, you know, we've been talking about movement for the majority of the last few podcasts and balance is just a huge component of movement. So it will sound a little similar, but we'll go through them and relate them to balance as well. So biggest one that is probably the most accessible to everyone because it's generally free um, is to literally take your shoes off and go out into nature. Um, so it's a good idea to start with sort of, um, you know, stable surfaces and sort of easy textures. So a, a good place to start might be literally just going to the park barefoot. And the barefoot part is about, like we talked about before, it's those is, senses. Yeah, yeah, it's it's training those senses and training that foot brain connection and regaining it because most people have really lost it and their feet are so 
Interestingly, people's feet are so sensitive because they don't get the exposure to the natural environment. They're cushioned and they so they can become really sensitive, but that oh, it's almost over sensation and they can't actually feel what's happening on like they can't feel it properly. It's it's clouded by pain or like discomfort. Mm. Um, whereas if you get used to using the senses, then they get a little, I guess, desensitized to those um, less, you know, uncomfortable yeah. parts of the environment, and you can actually enjoy. And we found it to the extreme, you know. Yeah. The more like, and more you do it, the crazier the things you can stand on without yeah. feeling it. And, and now we stand on things that people wouldn't, a lot of most people wouldn't dream of standing on, mm. and it feels great. So it's yeah, desensitizing the feet to that, but also training their ability to sense the things that you want them to sense. Um, just getting rid of the blindfold, basically. <laughs> Um, for yeah, to shorten that, but um, also, so start with sort of stable, env- stable environments and stable surfaces, and less complex or more simple natural movements: squatting, walking, crawling, um, rolling. You know, these are all really great ways to activate your vestibular system. And and um, I'll just plug quickly the practice of natural movement by Owen Lacour, which was the, the topic of um, one of our previous podcasts, because um, he has a great chapter on balance and obviously just the very active learning natural movements on stable surfaces and eventually unstable surfaces is really how we're supposed to learn balance. Um, all of these slacklining and surfing and all these things are kind of like bonuses, but it, these are this is a really good place to start. So start with low level, simple movements on stable surfaces, and slowly progress to complex, more complex movements on less stable surfaces. And um, yeah, that book and and the program of MoveNat is creates a really good blueprint of how to do all of that and how to progress that safely. So highly, highly recommend that. Um, and yeah, the natural environments, yeah, like we were saying before, they just stimulate, they just encourage balancing. It's great. Like you just go through a creek, you're going to have to balance on rocks. If you yeah, climb yeah. a tree, you're going to have to balance on a branch. Like if you... You could go to a playground, for example, which adults wouldn't usually do. But, mm. you know, you compare that to a natural playground and... Yeah, the challenges and the different exposures that you get in the one space is crazy. Yeah, yeah. And it just, it opens up, it kind of either forces you to, to use those systems or it opens up a lot of opportunity to do that. So And it lets you know where your limits are as well because yeah. like you were saying before, when you are faced with that in a battle with the mind about, okay, <laughs> well, can I make that leap or yeah. will I be able to stick that landing? You know what you got to work on and, and you know where your limitations are. Yeah, exactly. So it's the natural environment is really the, the ultimate test for it. But yeah, you can, you can practice natural movements in you know, less natural or more controlled environments and then progress up to that because you know, we don't want to say, oh, your balance is poor, go out and rock up because <laughs> it, it can be dangerous yeah. if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't have that sort of baseline of stability. So build that up and yeah it's a bit of that sort of work versus play approach you don't you want to do it in a way that you want to do it in a way that's progressive and and challenging um it, which is sort of that work approach but then working so that you can then play and express it in a fun and enjoyable way um so another thing to start integrating um Again, this is sort of like a supplement, I suppose, that can either help improve, accelerate or improve your ability with some of these natural movements, uh, things like unilateral strength or plyometric training exercises. So unilateral just meaning, you know, one side. <laughs> um, so single leg deadlifts, Cossack squats, shrimp squats, pistol squats, um, even, you know, building up to things like single leg hops or uh, jump, like lateral jumping, things like that. Anything where you're... Not on two feet. Not Yeah, not on two feet. Yeah, and I mean, Cossack squats, 
I guess, uh, are on two feet, but you're moving laterally side to side, mostly using one side, and it's not going to take as much balance as a single leg one, but there's a lot of different progressions. Obviously, again, not everyone's going to be able to jump straight into single leg squats, single leg deadlifts. There's all these progressions, but it's about going, okay, I want to be able to do that. What are, what are the, yeah, what are the progressions to get there? And then working through, again, this is more of that work-based approach. Um, but strength training and plyometric training can have really good carryover into more of those natural movements and vice versa. Um, but really, really, uh, valuable things to work on, especially if you are struggling with certain things like, you know, knee pain or ankle impingement or ankle restriction or things like that, then the more controlled sort of repetitive strength training exercises well, that's what I've found for myself and for a lot of my clients and for, you know, a lot of the professionals I know in the industry is that, you know, controlled, repetitive, progressive strength training can be, can work amazing things on the body because it's just about improving your tolerance to load really. And then once you do have that layer and that foundation of strength, it's much easier to explore those other types of movements, um, especially if you're out of pain. Mm. Um, learning new skills, hmm. ringing a bell. Um, <laughs> so some good ones to consider for balance are things like Tai Chi, uh, and yoga and Pilates. I know all of these, um, really incorporate a lot of balance training, um, martial arts. So anything involving kicking or I, I'm a big fan of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu because it's, which is basically grappling, um, sub submission grappling and that involves obviously standing up but then also as in standing up and trying to take someone to the ground so now you've got this other element of now someone else is trying to knock you off your balance yeah and that is such a huge thing in brazilian jiu-jitsu is they call it position before submission and so you want to have your position and your posture so that you're in a strong, stable position before you start trying to grab an arm to, to bend <laughs> or a, a neck to choke. Because if you're not stable and you are grabbing and trying to submit this person, suddenly you're knocked off your feet. Yeah, and it's, you- it's the ultimate test really, isn't it? Because you're looking after your balance and then wondering or having to analyze where their balance is at. And how to put them off balance to- without putting yourself off balance. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very interesting little chess match of, of the bodies. Um, and it, yeah, it's, I really like that. And I also like that it, there's so much rolling and, and sort of moving around and they really teach you how to fall because if you're wrestling with someone and they're trying to put you on the ground, you're going to fall at some point. And so learning how to fall or how to roll with a fall to absorb the impact is a really, really good thing. And, and that relates actually to the natural movement as well and, and parkour and things like that where they're jumping off these huge things. They can roll to absorb the impact. It's basically a controlled fall. Mm. And um, I'm going to chat with the guy. He run, runs an account called Science of Falling as well. But it's a, it's a really cool concept of like, yeah, no one wants to fall. And I suppose we probably should have mentioned this earlier, but you can't always prevent every fall. So if it's also a good idea to learn how to fall. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because I've had falls. I mean, I've got great balance, but I've had falls and I've fallen well which has prevented injuries if i never practice how to fall and i only practice only focused on getting my balance really good when i inevitably do fall because of some random thing that happens then i'm like oh injury but if you learn how to fall then that will really uh, that can save your bacon as well um side note but yeah really good stuff brazilian jiu-jitsu and then skating and things like skiing and snowboarding. So there's yeah, all these course. very dynamic, you know, interacting with the environment in a very uh, complex way, basically. Mm-hmm. And on a board or anything like that um, is very fun and a really cool way to express higher level balance. So again, you might want to start with very basic, simple skills. Uh, and then progress up to more of some more of those kind of risky ones and finding a community i think that's a really cool thing as well about you know these types of skills like tai chi and yoga and martial arts and even yeah skating and skiing and snowboarding those three are probably less 
um, accessible, but finding a community of people who are also doing that is a really good way to, to keep, keep up with it because yeah, it can, it can be a bit lonely by yourself trying to improve your balance. But if, it, if you're with a group of people or you, you do have a tribe of people around you who are also doing it, then that can really help. And I know you've been in touch with a, a bloke from down south um, in regards to, I guess, the benefits of balance training for skiing and snowboarding. Yeah. Know? And and how important he believes it is and, and how shocked he is that there isn't well, probably more. There's a lot of balance training, but I, a lot of stuff is done still in shoes and, and you know, there's there's this issue of no one's sort of really looking after the feet properly and which is strange because the feet are so important for balance and so yeah i think yeah it it applies to so many things and and having um yeah having people in those communities who are going yeah it's really good to train your balance and and everything is important and i guess that's what we're trying to develop with our community as well as jump you know get a beam make a beam and start training and these are some cool things that you can play with and you know there's a now there's people that tag tag us you know it's a it's a whole well, instagram I mean, community yeah, the, around the, balancing which the, the beauty of the community is is that it's a community of a heap of different people who are also members of other communities who yeah. are able to disseminate what they learn and and you know what they take from the, the philosophies that we put out and and, and take them into their communities there's the surf physio down on the Goldie and, um, you know, the, there's and countless others. You yeah, know. yeah, yeah, exactly. Mick yeah. with his running and, and Liz, so many others. Yeah, all the foot nerds in Australia and, and who all have their own clients who then all have their own families. And it's this way of going, yes, balance training is really important. It doesn't have to be boring. It can be fun. Um, and that, I guess, leads us into the last strategy, which is obviously there's learning new skills. There's a bit of overlap here. Learning new skills and then playing with balance. So just... Yeah, hopping on a beam, you know, playing with some progressions on the beam or with, with the hacky on the beam or just with the hacky off the beam, whatever level you're at. Um, you know, things like slack lining and surfing and stand-up paddle boarding and indo boarding, uh, which we've got one here. It's a very fun activity. Mm. All of these things to just introduce a little bit more risk into the, scenario, into the um, situation which is that play, yeah, really that play-based element and allowing you to explore the balance in a creative way. And the risk is an interesting one, actually, because, again, when we're out at TFC Bush 1, we, we're playing around on the the Bush HQ, which is this new A-frame <laughs> made of all these beams, basically, all these natural she-oak beams. And so I, you know, naturally run up straight to the top and start balancing on the top beam and... It looks like a gymnasium, like a, yeah. a jungle gym almost. Yeah. yeah, basically. And so I'm balancing on the top beam and it's quite high up. I don't know, maybe five meters up or something. Eight meters, I think it is. Oh, yeah, really? Eight okay. And a half meters, yeah. Right. So, yeah, fairly four, high no, up. No, six meters. Six sorry. meters, yeah. I overestimate. Yeah. Um, six meters up and your brain really tunes in because it, it knows if I fall off this. It's a problem. Now, I had very, I had a lot of confidence in my ability to balance on that because of how much balancing I've done on beams in the past. So I knew I wasn't going to fall, but I also knew I needed to focus. And it's the ele that element of risk can really bump up your balance abilities um, when it needs to. So that's it's a cool thing to add in. Um, so yeah, exposure to natural environments and natural movements, especially barefoot. Get into some unilateral or single leg strength training and plyometric training, learn some new skills, whatever floats your boat really in terms of the skills, but something that involves balance and a preferably a community and then just playing with it, just getting creative, exploring it and, you know, in an unstructured way and introducing a bit of element, a bit of risk. I'm not going to say go out and climb a six meter structure <laughs> and balance on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's just, you know, that relative risk of, okay, if I... If I fall off here, I might, you know, I might land a bit heavy or, you know, some, something like that. Don't push it too Don't far. Go six meters up. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Until um, you're ready. <laughs> into, unless you're extremely confident. But it kind of goes without saying. And I don't think... The cool thing is people... Unless... There's a, yeah, there's a small percentage of people who are just like, yeah, let me add it. I'll have a go. <laughs> yeah. But most people are pretty... Are pretty um, cautious. Cautious <laughs> when it comes to that kind of stuff. For good reason. So... 
Um, stay safe. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, get, get a little risque here and there with your balance training. And yeah, obviously we've got plenty of resources uh, on balance training and um, you know benefits of beam training and things like that on our website and on our social channels. So you can check all of those out uh, if you're wanting tips and ideas. And obviously we do sell the balance beams and you can also make your own balance beam and yeah, just get inspiration and share inspiration with us if you're on a balancing journey or a beam journey or you're making your own beam or whatever. Um, share it with us. We love seeing people balance on stuff. <laughs> and, yeah. um, and we'll be coming to a town near true. you soon as well. Um, the yep. Sydney and Melbourne workshops are all but locked in um so yeah that'll be towards the end of march and the beginning of april we'll be in town around city and melbourne so keep across our socials and yeah the website to see when those events are locked in and we hope to see some of you there yeah it's good fun uh, getting a whole group of people balancing together is uh is always good well, the fun. Bris- yeah the brizzy workshop on the weekend was awesome yeah great yeah. turnout and 20 people in a big room all laughing and smiling and playing on a beam is yeah it's a good and vibe. balancing yeah, yeah exactly um so yeah thank you for tuning in and we'll catch you next week which will be for breath this time <laughs>